The whole story, the big picture on the box of jigsaw puzzle pieces, the picture of how God loves us is laid out plain enough in Jesus, who now lives in you. It's the story of a beloved who became the lover. For God so loved the world. Now you do it. Love your sister, love your brother, love your neighbor, love your spouse. God loves you. Christ shows you how love works. Now you love. What's up, Liberty? Stand to your feet and worship with us. The Lord is faithful. He is faithful. Yeah, you're faithful, Lord. I am holding on to faith. Cause I know you 
Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is He who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater, for this is the testimony of God that He has borne concerning His Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in Himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar, because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. And this is the testimony, that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. This morning, uh, this afternoon, for, for this evening, we'll get there eventually. First John chapter 5, it's been a long day. And by the way, if you had to get up here and follow Jackie Hill Perry, you'd be all messed up too. Just want you to know. Didn't she do great this morning? Awesome job. First John chapter 5, you heard that last couple of words that there in verse 12 that it says, whoever has the Son of God has life and whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. That ultimately is what we talk about every single week here in Campus Community. It's what we talk about in our classes, what we talk about in our community groups. It's all this picture that it is all about Jesus. And if it is not all about Jesus, it is all a waste of time. And that is tonight the picture of what we're going to be walking through in these 12 verses. And so before we do that, let's pray that God blesses the reading of his word tonight. Father, we thank you for the great hope that we find in you. God, we are so grateful that in every situation and every challenge that we face and every problem that we walk through, God, that we have you to depend on, that you never leave us, you never forsake us, as Romans chapter 8 says, and nothing can separate us from the love of God. And we're so grateful that is true. And so, God, I pray that tonight, as we spend time in your word, as we spend time looking at these verses that, that emphasize the power of love and the power of obedience and what you expect from us as your children, God, I pray that you would bring to mind once again all that we have studied, all that we have learned, going all the way back to the first part of this book in 1 John, and we would see again tonight what you have for us through your spirit and God, we thank you for the great hope we have in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, obviously we've been, we call this entire series Now Love. And the reason for that is obviously in the 132 verses that are found in 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, the word love is used over 50 times. But especially for tonight and last week, like this is kind of like the, the crux of it. This is like the main part of this passage that John writes talking about love. In fact, last week or two weeks ago when Charles was speaking from 1 John chapter 4, beginning with verse 7 of 1 John chapter 4, all the way up to the third verse of 1 John chapter 5, the word love is used over 30 times. And so we know that in this part of the passage, there are some very important truths that God wants us to have as it relates to love, what love looks like, what love is all about. And so tonight, that's what we're going to talk about. And so in these 12 verses, there are kind of three basic ideas, three basic thoughts that we can kind of pull out of this passage. And so tonight, I just want to walk you through these three uh, different thoughts, these three ideas that come from these 12 verses and, and maybe a little bit of context within each one of them. And hopefully when we walk out of here tonight, we will have a deeper understanding of God's intention, God's design for us to love. And so the first thing, if you're taking notes tonight, just grab the pen. And the first thing we want to share with you is this. Faith works. Faith works. 
Now, you heard some of the songs we had tonight that talked about faith, talking about believing in something that we cannot see. And that one day, while our faith might, will become sight, that right now, that faith is driven to the idea, the picture of that, like we must believe without seeing. And so tonight, the first couple of verses here, we get this picture of faith works. And the first idea of what faith does and how it works in our journey is that it drives us to love. Go back to verse 1 of this passage. You heard it a moment ago. We'll read it again. It says this, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. Now, remember, this entire letter that was written by John was written to refute the Gnosticism that was present within the church at that time. The idea that Jesus was not actually God, that there was, his deity was not real. Uh, they were talking about the fact that Jesus, in fact, some of the, uh, the Gnostics were preaching a message that Jesus, that he was just a man. But when he was baptized, that that is when he became God, that, that the Christ descended on him, the spirit of Christ descended on him, and that it left him before the crucifixion. And so here, John writes right here in this verse, verse, that everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, and that word Christ is the, the, the Greek form of the Hebrew word Messiah, the anointed one, that everyone who believes that Jesus is the Messiah has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. And this picture is basically this, is that if you say you love God, if you say that you love God the Father through his son, Jesus Christ, that there is no option, that there is no choice, that, that you are commanded to love the other children of God. And we goes back all the way back to Matthew chapter 22, when Jesus was asked, what's the most important commandment? He said to love the Lord your God, all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. In other passages of scripture, Jesus said, not only love your neighbor, he said, love your enemy. He told us that we have a duty and a responsibility to love. Alfred Plummer said it this way, talking about this verse. And he writes these words. He says, everyone who believes the incarnation, the incarnation is the picture of God becoming flesh in Jesus Christ. Everyone who believes the incarnation is a child of God. And if every child of God loves its father, Therefore, every believer in the incarnation loves God. So every believer in the incarnation loves God. So everyone who loves God loves the children of God. Therefore, every believer in the incarnation loves the children of God. In other words, you do not have a choice that we are called to love the children of God. Basically, we would say this way. If you say you go love God the Father, if you say you love God the Son, then you better love the people who also call God their Father and God their Son. In other words, we would say it this way. If you love the parent, you better love the kids. Now, to give you a little bit of illustration of what this passage is really saying, I just want to kind of get some, uh, someone to help me out here. And I'm going to ask a question like, who right now in this room is taking a class with David Wheeler right now? Is in David Wheeler's class. Okay, so let me, let me kind of fine tune a little bit. Who here is taking a class with David Wheeler and you think David Wheeler is the greatest professor you've ever seen, ever heard, ever thought of? He's awesome. He's amazing, incredible. Somebody like, who, who wants to help me and who believes that? Some, somebody better believe that. Like wave your hands if you believe that, like absolutely. Okay, right up here. So I'm gonna come back, I'm gonna come down over here. You're gonna help me out in the sermon a little bit tonight. So I'm gonna walk up here. In fact, David, come with me. Welcome, David Wheeler, everybody. Come on, David. How are you? What's your name? Paris. Paris? Yeah. Where are you from? I'm from South Carolina. South, what part of South Carolina? Uh, Spartanburg. Spartanburg. Awesome. Very cool. So, okay, so Paris, here's the deal. You got class with David, right? Oh, by the way, this is Kara. Kara, nice to meet you. Yeah, awesome. Okay, so you, you love David Wheeler. You think he's an awesome professor. You respect him highly. You think he's great. You think he's incredible. Yeah. Okay, so the picture is this. So let's say you like, have class with him. When do you have class with him? Um, it's really meaningful to you, isn't it? At some point in my life. Now, when, when? At three. What day? On uh, Wednesdays. Wednesdays. Okay, so let's say next Wednesday you go to class. You're walking in there. You're having a connection with David. You're listening to him share, and you're talking to the class, going through all the, uh, the, the curriculum for the day. And, man, you're just, like, impressed. You're just blown away by everything that David has given you right there in that moment, okay? Like, it's awesome. It's incredible. And you're saying, David, you're, you're amazing, man. I love you as a professor. You're, you're unbelievable, okay? But then let's say that class comes to an end. 
And then at the end of the class, you're walking out of the class. And as you're walking out of the class with David, you come out into the hallway. And by the way, the greatest thing about David is not David. It's the fact that this is his daughter, Kara. All right. We love Kara Wheeler here. So... So let's say that, that Kara is coming down the hall going into the class because she's going to meet up with David because they're going to go to lunch after the class or dinner if it's a late class, right? So Kara's walking in. As Kara's walking in, after you're walking out with this incredible class with your favorite professor, David Wheeler, you bump <laughs> into Kara in the hallway. She's carrying some books and she drops all of her books and you drop all of your books. And you say, will you watch where you're going next time, you idiot? Why did you do that to me? Now let's say you do that, okay? I'm not saying you would, Paris, but let's just, say you, let's just say you did. And David happened to be walking out behind you because he's going to meet his lovely daughter to go to dinner. Now, here's the key. That's not going to change your relationship with David because he's still going to be your professor. He's still going to be your professor, and you're still going to respect him, and you're still going to think he's awesome. But there obviously, as David sees you treat his daughter that way, there's going to be a wall that's going to be built up between you and David. Like instantly, all of a sudden, there you go. All of a sudden, while, while David might still give you everything that he was going to give you in that class and teach you just as well as he was going to teach you before, here's what is true. Like David is going to have in his humanity, he's going to sit back and think like, man, Paris, I'm not so sure about her. You get the picture, right? Well, that's the same picture of what this verse is talking about, that anyone who loves God, everyone who counts on and believes in God as their father through the son, Jesus Christ, better love the children of God. And that's the picture. Okay, and so that's what this verse is talking about. That's what John, and that gives us the illustration here of what this is really about, that if you don't treat his daughter well, that honestly, there's gonna be some challenges between you and David. The same thing is true between us and God if we do not love his children. So hey, thank you, David Kerr. Appreciate you guys very much. That's awesome. Now, Paris. So I want you to hang back one minute. So, so just to thank you for helping us out tonight. So last Friday we, we had Convo and, and, and apparently according to the great, you know, the, the, the great people who take care of the Gimme Liberty, Gimme Liberty uh, Instagram page, apparently I said this statement like you are no longer slaves to Slims, right? <laughs> and so anybody hear that? Anybody hear? So yeah. So in, in order to make it up to Slim Chickens, I've got some Slim Chickens right here. <laughs> So Slim Chickens, uh, chicken fingers and fries for you. Go enjoy it up there. That's awesome. Okay. Let's give Paris a hand. Okay, so this passage tells us that we have a requirement. We have a duty. We have a responsibility to love. We do not have a choice. We do not have an option. We must love. And so, okay, bring it back. Calm down. We're all back in the Word of God. All right. So if we have a duty and a responsibility to love God, if we have that, that calling that God wants us to love Him and to love His Son, Jesus Christ, who is the incarnation, the, the one who came and put on flesh for each and every one of us, that we have a responsibility to love His children. We do not have a choice in the matter. We do not have a privilege or the opportunity to say, no, I'm not going to really do that. We've got to make sure that if we love the parent, we've got to love the kids too. In fact, if you go back in chapter 3, it tells us that anyone who has hate for someone else is, is not really truly a follower of Christ. Chapter 4 says the same thing, that if anyone hates, that he is not of God. Clearly, we get the picture that we must love. And that's what faith does for us. Trusting in God drives us to love God's children. Now, the second thing it does, it not only tells us that, that love uh, drives, you know, it drives us to love, but it also drives us to obedience. It drives us to obey God's word. So go to verses two and three. Verses two, two and three, it says this, by this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and obey his commandments, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Now, that first part of verse two is kind of in the opposite direction of what we would think. It's kind of in a different order than what we'd expect. What we'd expect it to say is that if we love God, we will love his children. But what it says is that we know that we love the children of God because we love God the Father. In other words, if you love God the Father, it is a natural byproduct. It flows right from the fact that we love God, that we will naturally love his children if we truly love him. But it goes on to tell us that not only do we love them, but... This is the love of God that we keep his commandments. In other words, we do what it is that God calls us to do. 
we obey the words of God. In this scripture, it clearly tells us that that last statement is commandments are not burdensome. In other words, that word there is the Greek word baterus, which literally means like heavy. That his, his commandments for us, the things that he's called us to do, it's not so tough that we can't do it. It's not too heavy on us. We, 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 we understand, like we can do what God calls us to do. It goes along with what Jackie Hill Perry said today in, in her, her message. It clearly says, like, we obey because it changes. We love God. It changes our desires. It changes our passions. It changes what we want to do because we love God. And that's what this passage says. John writes, these are not burdensome. Warren Wiersbe said it this way, everything in creation except man obeys the will of God. And if you think about that, the scripture says, even the wind and the waves obey him. And we go back in the passage when Jesus walked on the water, when he calmed those seas. And so this passage tells us that his ways, his, his commandments to us, that we find in lots of different places in Scripture, not only in the Old Testament, but also in the Sermon on the Mount. Also in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we clearly get the picture like it's not that difficult to follow him and to obey his words. And so it drives us to obey what God calls us to obey. It drives us to have a testimony and a witness. In fact, if we truly love God the way that we say we love him, and as a result, we love his children because we should, then obviously our desire should be this, that we want more people to become children of God, that we want to make sure we're sharing the gospel with as many people as we possibly can so that there will be more people in the family. Ultimately, what it comes down to is this, that word burdensome, the fact that these are not a difficult thing to do. Ultimately, what is it? It's easier not to sin than it is to sin. Now, if you think about the consequences of sin, whatever those consequences might be, whatever the sin might be in your life, when you look at it according to the long game, I don't mean like in the moment, but, but as time goes by, ultimately the picture we get is this, it is far easier not to sin than it is to sin because sin always brings with it consequence. It always brings with it results. It always brings with it baggage that creates problems in our lives, the hearts that are broken and challenges that arise because of our sin. It's easier not to sin than it is to sin. And that's what John is writing here. These commandments are not too heavy. They're not too burdensome. So this passage tells us that our faith, it drives us to love. Our faith, it, it drives us to obey, but it also drives us to victory. It leads us to victory. Look what it says in verses four and five. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? What this passage says is this, is you've already won the race. You've already won this thing called life. Now, many of you, obviously, some of you are freshmen, some sophomores, some juniors, some seniors. Some will graduate in about a month. You're going to walk out of this place and go wherever tomorrow might hold for you. And understand this, as you begin your journey in this life, as you begin careers, as you begin families, all of the things that are yet ahead for you, with all of the issues and the challenges that you will undoubtedly face in the days to come, what God's Word says is you have already won this thing called life. You've already won this race, not because of what you've done, but because of what God has done through his son, Jesus. David Anders says it this way, we won it in the past tense with our union in Christ, and we win it present tense by our refusal to deny him and obey. In other words, while we already have this promise from God, that victory is ours because of what Christ has done. Because we already know that, that as we walk through this thing called life, we do not need to fear the battles that are ahead because the battles have already been won. What we also must understand is that we can miss out on much of what God has for us if we choose or refuse to obey and follow him in the day. And so when we walk through life in victory, the important thing we have to recognize is this, not only walk through life understanding, yeah, because of what God has done, man, I've already won the race. Walk through as a victor. Walk through as a winner. Walk through life understanding that because I am a winner, because I am a victor because of Christ, that man, I'm gonna do exactly what it is that God has called me to do. It drives us to victory. So the first thought, faith works. The second thought, uh, second thought faith assures. Look what it says in uh, verse 6. And this is a guarantee that, that Jesus is God, how it assures us. 
Verse 6 says this, this is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. Now, you read this passage and there are lots of different interpretations you can walk away from it. And you can take that verse and read it in several different ways. In fact, some commentators take it and talk about maybe that's talking about when Jesus uh, was hanging on the cross and they, they put the spear in his side and water and blood came from his side. But that's not what it's referring to. Again, remember, John is writing to refute Gnosticism. He's writing to refute people who are saying that Jesus was just a man that the Spirit descended on him at baptism, but left him before the cross, left him before crucifixion. And so here John says, no, not only was he born of God, uh, not only did he come because of water, as it says in verse six, but by the water only, but by the water and the blood. In other words, if we trust in Jesus only because Christ was with him from his baptism up through the resurrection, then we're wasting our time because he was never God at all. There's no point in following a man who's just a man. There's no point in following a man who is not deity, is not God himself. And so John uh, accentuates the fact that he is not only Christ because of the water, the baptism when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, but also by the blood. In other words, that he was Christ all the way to the point that he died and shed his blood for all of mankind, that he was still Christ at that point. He was still Christ when he was placed in the tomb. He was still Christ when he rose from the grave three days later. And he was Christ all the way to the moment that he ascended into heaven. And today that same Christ is alive and he is sitting at the right hand of the Father praying for each and every one of us. It is a guarantee that Jesus is God. And as we walk through life, we recognize that we live in a world that is constantly trying to tell us Jesus is a great leader, a great teacher, a great model, a great rabbi, but he is not God. But yet God's word testifies to itself. Jesus is exactly who he said he was. He is God. John refutes this heresy of the Gnostics by, by, by literally saying like there is no question that not only was he God at the beginning, he was God at the end, he has always been and he will always be. But then he tags verse six with one more statement. And the spirit is the one who testifies because the spirit is the truth. Which brings us to the second way that our faith assures us is by a testimony of truth, verses seven and eight. It says, for there are three that testify, the spirit and the water and the blood. In other words, this statement tells us that we have three statements that come from the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God that descended on Jesus when, when he was there being baptized. And clearly we heard God's word in that passage. If you go back to Matthew chapter three, where it says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And then obviously when he went to the cross, when he died on the cross, when his blood was shed for all of mankind, these three things testify to the fact that Jesus is God. It's a trifold witness to the power of God. And so our faith works and it leads us to love. Our faith works and it leads us to obey. Our faith works that it leads us to victory. Our faith assures us when a guarantee by God and testimony of truth. But then the third thought that comes from this passage is this, is that our faith is validated by a promise. And so what is this promise? It's really twofold. We find it in verses nine and 10. And this is first the word of the Father. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he is born concerning his son. Whoever believes in the son of God has the testimony in himself. And whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has born concerning his son. Ultimately, what John is saying is this, you cannot believe in God if you do not also believe in Jesus. And every religion other than Christianity, they all have gods. And you hear often people saying, we all, you know, we all love God and we all serve the same God. We're working in different paths. We're working our way to heaven and we're just taking different roads to get there. But yet what John here, state, the statement he makes is this, is you cannot say that you love God. You cannot say that you believe in God if you do not also love and believe in Jesus Christ. Because if you do, according to God's word, here's what you are doing. You are making God a liar. And so tonight, when we look at every other religion on the face of the earth, when they talk about God, but they discount the fact that Jesus is God, here's what they're saying. They're saying that even their God, all God, God is a liar. 
And if you're saying that God is a liar, then you have no hope, you have nothing to trust in, you have nothing to put your faith on, and you have no promise of tomorrow, no promise of eternity, because if God is a liar, then there's no point in following God at all. And so what John says here, here, listen, if you believe in the Son of God, if you believe that, then whatever, whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his son, which brings us to the second part of this promise. It's the word of the father, but it's also the word of life. In verses 11 and 12, it says, and this is the testimony, or this is the assurance, this is the promise that God gave us eternal life and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life and whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. Now, this is an echo of what John writes in his gospel in John chapter 14. In John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus makes the statement that no one comes to the Father except through him. That he makes that statement that the only way to the Father is through Jesus. Passage after passage and scripture after scripture, verse after verse, we find parts of this passage that tell us that clearly that Jesus is the only way that Jesus is the only chance we have in trusting and believing in Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tells us this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 uh, tells us this. Passage after passage, you must believe that Jesus is the only way. And so when it says that he who has the Father, he who believes in the Father and whoever has the Son has life and whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. If you do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God who came to take away the sins of the world, if you do not believe that he is that Christos, that, that Messiah, the anointed one who came and laid down his life for all of mankind, if you've not trusted in him, if you've not believed in him, if you've not given your life to him, if you've not repented and turned from the sin of rejecting Christ, then you have no promise of heaven or eternal life. And if you are part of a crowd that says, we're all working to the same way, we're, we're getting to heaven on our own path and our own route, we're all going there. And if you believe that, but you do not believe in Jesus, you will spend eternity in a real place called hell. A place that scripture clearly tells us over and over again is a place of, of eternal damnation, a place of eternal suffering, a place of, of sorrow and pain. And so John makes this statement, whoever has the son has life. And that one statement should be underlined or highlighted or circled in every Bible that you own. Whoever has the son has life. Because I can promise you this, as you walk through this thing called life, as you face the challenges that are yet ahead, when you are challenged in your faith, when people come after you and try to, uh, to, to tell you that what you believe doesn't matter and what you believe about Jesus is not true, when they try to, to make your faith in Christ irrelevant, you need to be reminded of what God's word says. And what God says, word says is this, whoever has the son has life. Whoever has the son has victory. Whoever has the Son has the promise of eternity. Whoever has the Son has the promise of heaven. Whoever has the Son has everything that God intends for you to have. That there is nothing on this world and nothing beyond this world that God uh, will not, that he will hold back from you if you have the Son. Why? Because if you have the Son of God as your Savior, if you believe that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, and have trusted in him, you have been given life eternal and there's nothing on this earth that can ever stop you. There's nothing on this earth that can ever rip that away from you. That there's nothing on this earth that can ever pull that from your hands. And I don't know about you, but that's a great promise to lean on. That's a great thing that we can trust in, that we can come to the place that no matter what we're going through in the day, that we recognize, man, I don't care how bad today is, I've got the Son of God. And because I've got the Son of God as my Savior, I know I have life. So let me give you a couple of quick ideas that, that we can kind of bring this to a conclusion. The first one is this. A relationship with God is only possible through his son and he is the only way to eternal life. That's what John is writing here, not only in all of his writings in scripture, but certainly in these 12 verses, that a relationship with God is only possible through God's son. It cannot come in any other way. The second big idea is just simply this. We demonstrate that relationship through loving God 
and obeying him. And there is no middle ground. You don't have an option to do anything differently than that. You don't have an option to write your own script. You don't have the option to figure out how you can change the narrative where you can say, yeah, man, I, I trusted Christ and I believed him as my Lord and Savior and I, I, prom- I know I've got that promise of heaven and I've got that promise of eternity and then walk out from that moment and live however you want to live. And Jackie Hill Perry talked about that this morning. We've got to put the two together, that the hope that we have, the promise that we have is loving God and following him and doing what he calls us to do. And if you can't put all of that together, then scripture even says this, that you have to question whether you actually are following him at all. And so the statement gives us, we demonstrate the relationship we have with God through loving him and obeying him, no middle ground. So I just want to ask you to kind of take a few moments and just kind of do a little bit of introspection. To take a moment where you kind of look inside and ask yourself some pretty detailed and and private, important questions in your life. And these are questions that honestly, no one really should have the opportunity of asking you that you need to ask these yourself between you and God and God alone. Do I truly believe that Jesus is the son of God? I know you're sitting here at a Christian school and I can guarantee you that whether you're a freshman or whether you are a senior, whether you're a graduate student, what I know is simply this, is if you've spent any time here at Liberty at all, you've heard the gospel umpteen times. You've heard it over and over again. You've heard it in classes. You've heard it in Convo. You've heard it in campus community. You've heard it from friends. You've heard it in community groups. And you're going to keep on hearing it until the day you leave this campus. But hearing it does not actually do anything. Hearing the gospel doesn't change your future, doesn't change your life. Hearing the gospel doesn't promise you and give you the guarantee of heaven, eternity with him. What has to do, what you have to do is you have to take what you hear and you have to make it personal. You have to actually make it something that you understand and that you believe with all of your heart, that you believe that he is God's son and he died and rose again. That you do have to turn from the sin of rejecting Christ and that you have to run to him. That whole word of repentance literally is the idea of doing a 180, a complete turnaround, walking one path, changing the path and going the other direction. So do you truly believe in Jesus Christ, trusting him as your, as, uh, as your savior, that he is the son of God. And if not, then tonight, when you get to community groups, when maybe when this campus community is over, talk with one of our shepherds and just make sure things are good. Make sure things are right. Make sure you've gotten that relationship. Like it is set, it is locked in stone. Because hearing it, being surrounded by it, being annoyed by it, hearing it over and over again, it will not give you the promise of heaven. Only truly believing it will do it. Second question, in your own life, are you working to obey the commands of God? Are you diligent in trying to follow what it is that that, that God has called you to do? And I don't mean called you to do as far as a career or called you to do as ministry. I'm talking about what God has called you to do in obedience. If you read through again, as I mentioned earlier, the Sermon on the Mount, if you read through like 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and and other passages of Scripture, lots of different things where God's Word clearly tells you if you're a follower of Christ, these are the things that you should do. These are the marks of the believer. Are you trying to infuse those into your journey and in your life? And if not, then what I will tell you is this, that that is sin and it is something for which you need to repent of. Because if you are not obeying what God's Word says to do, then what you are actively doing is disobeying God. And that's something that you need to repent from. And so you need to understand, am I doing all that I can to follow him? And when I mess up, am I getting on my knees before God in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, and just simply saying, God, I'm sorry. Forgive me of my sins. He's already said he's faithful and just, and he will forgive you. Are you trusting his word? Third thing, fourth thing, last thing. It's just simply this. What are you doing in your journey to be a reflection of the love of Christ? We talked about this idea that so often we, you know, we, we treat one group of people one way. We treat another group of people a different way. That we say, yeah, man, I love him, but man, I'm not so sure about this person. Hey, are, what are you doing to make sure that you are a reflection of God's love? You heard the way this passage started. If you are a child of God, 
If you call him your father, if you've believed in Jesus as the son of God, then you also have to love the children of God. You have to love those who are walking that same journey. What are you doing to actively reflect the love of Christ in everyday life? That is what will change the rest of your future. That is what will change every day for the rest of your life as you walk through this thing called life. That is what will make that journey so much sweeter when you're actively working to not just love the people you like, but you're working to love everyone according to God's word. And so this passage tells us, whoever has the son of God has life. Man, that's an incredible promise, but it's also an incredible responsibility. It's something that as we walk through life knowing that heaven is ours, then it ought to dictate how we live here. Living our lives as Christians with our minds only fixed on the fact that we have the promise and the eternity of heaven, that we're going to spend our time there. If all we're worried about is what God has promised and we're not worried about how, what God expects, then I can promise you this, you'll still have heaven, but the rest of your life you'll be living in a place called hell. Man, don't let that happen. Make sure that you are focused on living and making this moment and this time and this place. Make it a place that is a reflection of the goodness of God. And only you can do that. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the encouragement that it gives to us, the promise that it brings. But God, we also thank you for the correction that it points us to, the things in our lives that we need to change, that we need to fix, that we need to adjust. God, we sit here tonight and we recognize, man, we live in a world today that so desperately needs to hear about Jesus. They so desperately need to hear truth. As we heard about this morning, as, as we've read about here tonight, God, let us be the people who share truth with the world. Let us pe let be people that, that show the love of Christ everywhere we go to point people to him. God, we pray that you would help us to, to get out of the way in our humanity and allow you to lead us in every step, God, that our passion would be to run after you and to follow you in every step and every moment and not allowing our, our own desires and the things of this world to distract us from God's purpose and God's plan. God, we thank you for the gift of Jesus. We thank you that as we've read tonight, that when we believe in Jesus as the son of God, that we have victory. When we believe in Jesus as the son of God, we have salvation. When we believe in Jesus as the son of God, that we have life, life eternal. God, we thank you for that gift because we do not deserve it. And God, because we do not deserve it. Lord, I pray that you would help us every moment of every day to live as worthy recipients of the gift of your son. And God, for that, we will give you the praise and we'll give you the glory and how you're going to lead us every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
song could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Yes, we do. Jesus, the name above every other. Jesus, the only one. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you, Lord. Come on, pray your worship.
thank you for your presence here, Lord. Moving in our hearts, God. Lord, we thank you for the word spoken tonight, Lord. Lord, we ask that it would fall on good soil, Lord. That it would change us, that it would shape us into the likeness of your son. We thank you, Jesus, for all you're doing. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all for worshiping with us. You are dismissed.